Welcome to the VizArt Podcast. This is episode number five, and I am excited to be here with an award-winning children's book author and illustrator, Janelle Cannon. Janelle, welcome. Thank you. It's a joy to be here. (laughs) Very excited. Um, When I started this podcast, you were actually one of the people I thought about on wanting to get your story and how you got into the business. Um, I've known your work ever since I was a little kid. Um, And so it's resonated with me. It's resonated with some of the other artists and people who um, have seen your work throughout the years. And I am excited to kind of see the backstory on how how this came to be and who is this Stella Luna uh, character in some of your other books that I've read. So I think we can almost jump right in and you know, tell me a little bit about yourself and kind of how long you've been creating and drawing. Well, drawing and storytelling has been something I've done since I was very, very young. And I was lucky to be what (laughs) we like to call a free range kid when I was growing up back in Minnesota. So we lived in a a new suburb that was surrounded by countryside. So we were able to, you know, especially in the summers, just run into the forest. You know, we had rivers and lakes, and we had this amazing natural pond just right over the hill from our house. And it was teeming with frogs and salamanders and crawdads, fish, everything. And we just lived over there. This is when, like, the parents would just let you say, hey, you go out, you go have fun and come back at at dinner time. Yeah, mom just said, go outside. (laughs) Get out of here. And you had nature. So nature was your friend since at the the beginning age. And um, and then I guess over the years you – started meeting more and more critters and creatures and bring them into your uh, storytelling? Well, they were interesting. You know, I'm, I've always been interested in the biological sciences and, and um, just the anatomy and physiology and the way these animals survive. So, you know, just studying any form of life begins to create questions you know, which leads to the next question, to the next question, and pretty soon you realize that everything is connected. You know? So, yeah, I, I, um, nature inspired curiosity. And with curiosity, you know, it just causes you to continuously ask questions and explore. And, and I'm still the same way. I mean, I just look at everything and... and wonder why things are the way they are and and it's i guess it it just invites lifetime learning yeah yeah it's never ending it's the circle of life i guess you could say keep going uh when did you realize you wanted to be a an author i mean you were out there you know you've experienced nature was this something you wanted to is this something you wanted to write about as a kid or was it kind of later on in life where you realized you know you want to kind of put it on pen to paper I consider myself more of a visual artist than a writer. Okay. Uh, so most of what I was doing as a kid was um, observing and trying to uh, draw what I was seeing. You know, it was these wondrous, crazy things. And I remember when I was a kid, I first discovered that ducks had teeth. <laughs> it's like, whoa, they've got teeth. And so I was just drawing ducks and the little tiny teeth and, you know, obsessing on that and then going on to the next thing. So I, I'm, I think of myself as a visual artist, and, um, but I still like to write. And when I was, I did never, uh, when I was a kid and as a young adult, I never said I'm going to be a, an author illustrator. I just sort of went, I really want to be somehow working in the visual arts and it's interesting because I ended up from a long circuitous route. I, I left uh, Minnesota when I was 18 and I um, worked Yellowstone Park cleaning cabins, my sister and I and, oh. and another friend of ours. And we ended up coming out to California because I thought, you know, I'm not going to experience one more Minnesota winter. <laughs> so we came out here in a rickety old Econo line van and with barely any money. And I had liked to joke that Carlsbad is where we ran out of money. <laughs> it's <laughs> yeah. not a bad place to run out of money. It's not a bad place at but, all. But so I just subsisted on, you know, menial labor 
you know, anything from cleaning hotels, working in the greenhouses, auto body. But I never stopped drawing or painting on the side. And so I, um, I was entering my paintings in local art shows and um, here on State Street, where your store is, yes. there were a lot of old antique shops, and so they let me hang my paintings in the stores on consignment. And um, one of the longtime residents here, Jim Hansen, he's a book dealer, and he had a booth in one of the shops, and he saw some of my artwork and said, who did that? You know, So um, he took an interest in my work and was interested in buying it. And um, at that time, I was living upstairs from the Sportsman's Bar, which um, was a relief. This whole street was quite run down. So and different. It was a total dive. There was fights in the alleys. It was $80 a month. You know, this thing. So it was a pretty crazy life. I didn't have a telephone. I didn't have anything. Wow. And so um, the antique store lady said, oh, there's somebody interested in your painting. So I went to the pay phone behind the donut shop and <laughs> called up these people and, and started a, a he started, you know, he and his wife, Pat Hansen, began to purchase my art. And he, I, I would trade, you know, uh, cash and books for art. <laughs> and so, um, and so they have, a, blood. they have a big collection of some of my earliest stuff. Oh, that's so but cool. Pat Hansen worked at the Carlsbad City Library, and um, I exhibited some of my work at the library, which was a nice um, experience. And artists locally can still do that. And um, um, a part-time graphics job opened up uh, in Pat Hansen's department, and she offered me the job. So I uh, was thrilled, and I started working part-time at the Carlsbad City Library in a small graphics you know department we had programs exhibits lectures department there and um and i think they still have some of those they they, they do those it's configured differently in the city though okay. um, yeah everything changes over time yes indeed and um so i did the uh that job part-time and then it went full-time and pretty soon i was doing uh, writing and illustrating summer reading programs for kids i was doing several newsletters including the children's uh, newsletters and so i was focusing on writing for kids and trying to make things interesting to so kids so that's where it kind of started for yeah. as far as the kids side of right. it cuz uh, i've mm -hmm. only seen i think you have six books published mm -hmm. currently and all of them are children's books right um so it's kind of stemmed from the Carlsbad library from you working there. That, right. I, I it never was, knew that. Yeah, it just sort of organically directed me kind of toward that. And, of course, I love books. I love reading. So I was looking at the shelves all the time of what's on, you know, uh, what kind of books are on the shelves in all the age ranges, but in picture books in particular because I've never outgrown them. And I noticed um, that there were very few stories about bats. And that was your love from a young yeah, age. Yeah, and I'd been doing, um, r every Halloween at the library, I, I, I was in, interested in educating kids, you know, and, and demythifying the whole bat thing, you know. The, the, there's just a lot of um, negative myths about bats. You know, they get yeah. caught in your hair and they're blind and, you know, all that stuff, which isn't true. And so I, I was, I was I, going yeah, to ask because bats, yeah. I mean, that's why it's so interesting is your first book was about a bat and so many people, it has, they have a wrong outlook on bats. They kind of have almost a bad name right. um, because they don't, they're not. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, reading your book, I actually read it again last night. My kids love it. It tells a, a story of, um, they're not as gross or mean as I think people think and scary. Right. And the first piece I wrote for the kids was a comic strip called The Fruit Bats Bad Rap. And it was back in the 80s when rap was starting to get popular. And then so it had the bats, you know, Dancing. rap and out and, and all in the rap rhythm. They were just, you know, talking about uh, all these myths and, you know, and it was an educational rap song, basically. So. So, yeah. And and there were three 
books on the shelf with with bat heroes in the picture book section and pretty soon two of them were shelved because they were so ratty that they were taken off the shelf and they went out of print so there's only one book left and that was the bat poet so I thought god you know I really think it would be neat to just put together a story about a bat because they're they they do have a bad rap and they're misunderstood and they're extraordinarily important ecologically. So um, I just started to think about that, you know, there was a need for it. And then National Geographic came out with a, an amazing photo uh, piece by Merlin Tuttle about Gambian epauletted fruit bats. And, and I fell in love with this particular species and I went, that's the one that I'll use as a model for my character. So you never really seen this bat before in person or no, because no. they didn't have them at the zoos at the time like Mm-mm. they do now. I, I think you go to the wild animal park and right. they have that with these big old bats hanging from the right. It's one of my son's favorite places to go in and, and look at them. Right. Were you familiar with, I mean, besides, I guess, reading about bats? I mean, did were you... Was that your favorite animal at the time? I am interested in all animals, but I started to focus in when I decided when you was... to, you know, zero in and try to complete a picture book. I, you know, I'd never tried to do that before. And so um, I wanted to draw the animals accurately. I don't like to disnify my characters. So I choose an already beautiful, cute animal and draw them as they are. But... I had to learn their anatomy and their physiology, and then by extension, I wanted to learn about bats as a whole. And so I just went into this crash course on, on uh, but, you know, epauletted fruit bats in particular and bats in general. And I would be, you know, was a member of Bat Conservation International when it was new, and so so it was. You know, my interest was also, you know, that that a lot of the species are endangered and they're very, again, as I said, ecologically important. There's over 1,300 species of bats in Gosh, the world. That's insane. I would have never yeah. even guessed. Yeah. Would, if you told me 100, I would have been blown away. Well, there, <laughs> in the mammal families in the world, rodents are the largest family of, you know, a variety of mammals, and then bats are the next, the Choroptera uh, family. So they're, you know, when you think about it, uh, they're the only mammal capable of powered flight, and then it, the power it gives them to move over wide ranges and to develop all these different, you know, niches in, in nature. You know, there's the fruit eaters, and when they consume the fruit, they, you know, they have a huge range, and as they fly, they're eliminating the seeds, you know, yep. and pooping out dropping, the seeds, and they're, they're regenerating the forest, <laughs> you know. And um, and then the insect eaters, uh, they're huge. Which you know, Stella Luna is. <laughs> actually, she's a fruit eater. Oh, yeah, the, yeah. the crick. I remember. Yeah, no, she's in the story, she's forced to eat a grasshopper. Yes, I remember the, the grasshopper. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, but yeah, the insect eating bats, you know, the in North America, there's over 50 species of insect eating bats, and they consume massive amounts of crop destroying beetles and moths, and they eat mosquitoes. And you know, which is one of the biggest disease vectors, you know, the mosquito. So we need but, bats. Yes, absolutely. And they, they're they're major pollinators, especially in equatorial regions of the world. They're um, essential for pollinating many vital crops. You know, mango, banana, durian. Um, so they're 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 a massive part of the ecological web. Wow. Yeah. So where does the name Stella Luna come from? I always, that's a question I've never asked you over the years that I've known you. And I've always been fascinated with that name. It took me a long time to think it up. I'd written the whole story and I still didn't know my character's name. It's like, come on, you know? (laughs) And so I had to imagine being a bat mother and, and flying through the, you know, I, my mind's eye, I was flying through the night and, and thinking about what I would name a bat baby. And then I was looking at the moon and the stars, and I love uh, Latin, 
in Spanish, and star is Stella, and moon is Luna. Stella's so right I combined those two um, from what the bats see every night in the part of their world. So I thought, wow. that is, that's a bat. That's name. the one. Yeah. And when that name hits, it's like, that's it. Yeah. It's, you know it instantly. Mm-hmm. And I'm the same way. When I do my artworks, there's so many times where I'm just waiting for my name to pop. Yeah, I have like a list of like 20 names, and I'm like, what is that? What, what am I going to name this piece? And I mean, it's kind of cool. I, did, I thought you had the name oh, God, before no. you uh, <laughs> before you wrote it, because obviously Stella Luna's, the name is throughout the whole book. So you just kind of had to write yeah. it. Oh, yeah. I did just pop it in. <laughs> it's like, now I know what her name is. So how did Stu- Stella Luna get to where it is now? So Stella Luna was um, published in 1993. This was your first children's book. You're working at the Carlsbad Library. How did it get to... How did you get it to get published and get your your book out there? Well, back in the 90s, in the wisdom du jour about getting published, which is very different now, yes, um, was that uh, in order to increase your odds of getting a book published, you had to find an agent to represent you. If you submitted an unrepresented manuscript, it would go into what they called the sludge pile in a, you know, in a big publishing house. And somebody, some poor soul would have to go through the sludge pile. And, you know, the odds of your work getting a much of a look was rare. So, so it wasn't a very, you know, you just didn't really have very good odds if you submitted it unsolicited. So I thought, God, you know, how do you get an agent? And so uh, back then it was, we still had card catalogs. Okay, the library. looking yeah. up the books. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and technically, you know, the term for the letter you write is a query. So I just went to, you know, Q and I, and I found a little book of specifically about writing queries to agents. Wow. And I checked it out and I read it cover to cover and absorbed, you know, that. And then I formed a very, very strategic letter to an agent in Del Mar, and her name is Sandy Dykstra. She's probably one of the most well-known agents on the West Coast. You know, most of the big agencies were back in New York, and I thought, well, it's kind of neat. I'd like to contact somebody right local. down the street here, down, yeah. you know, in Del Mar. So, but, you know, I'd read a lot about her, and you know, she mostly worked with adult fiction, nonfiction, and more of academic work. And I thought, well, I'm just going to write to her anyway. I don't think she works in picture books. But so I created a custom letter, an extremely brief, you know, summary of what I wanted to do with a, just a couple of color copies of the art connected. I'd already finished the book. And, um, uh, and then I wrote why I wrote to her. And then, because I know she was a you know serious business oriented person, I'd figure she'd want to know that I would have a, a stable of other ideas. So I drew all of my future characters running across the top of the paper, and and then I just briefly said these are the future books you know That's characters. So, cool. so and I sent it off, and not expecting much i i was ready to just you know keep writing keep going day, yeah work in the day job yeah right yeah. and yeah, and you, you almost think it's almost impossible right i, mean, I had no expectation I, at all I, I, and i was thrilled that i had finished this book it take took me almost two years to finish it and you know because i wanted to i had to know that i could do it i wouldn't dare submit something i hadn't finished so yet. that like this cover like the that artwork was already drawn and for the most part a actually lot of- it was everything but the cover okay and um and that's a whole nother <laughs> part nothers. of the process <laughs> yeah but um yeah so i just went back to work and and was sort of on the edge of my seat you know wondering if she would answer and i think within about a week I got a message on my phone. It was on the little tape cassette, and she was very enthusiastic and said, you know, let's go. You know, I'd like to sign up with you. Send me the, you know, manuscript, the whole thing. And I had it all mocked up and ready. You were so ready for it. And it just went (laughs) into the mail, and, you know, it was was a big moment. And... um, 
Long story short, she shopped it out, and within months, she had a contract with Harcourt Brace Jovanovich, which was had an office downtown. And we started working together, and you know, the whole editorial art design process was new to me, and I was brand new in that process. So that was an interesting navigational challenge, you know. To were you able to? stop working at the library and focus 100% on this or was it kind of you're no, still in I, between doing both? Yeah, I would work all day at the drawing table and then go home and if I had the energy I would work on the book So and on weekends. I mean, that's what it takes I yeah. mean, if, in any in industry. I think right. that, that's so important that mm-hmm. it's kind of cool to hear this coming from you is, uh, you know, you had you earned everything you were doing you were ready you put it out there you sent it you did your due diligence um not just hoping someone was going to come and find you because that's i think the problem with a lot of people is people do think that their idea or their artwork or their book is going to be just found and it's being proactive and, right. and knowing okay if this does be successful you already had some of your other characters kind of in your head like all right well when this happens you were already ready to go right you have is, to be on to the next thing yeah yeah you, you can't know? just sit yeah. and like oh my gosh this is gonna be great and then right. all of a sudden like hey we need a lot more from you and you're yeah. not ready right so I, that, that's very cool to hear and i think everybody's walking around with magnificent yeah. ideas i know but you have to sit down and put in arduous amounts of time to transfer a concept onto paper, whether you're typing a story or rendering art. It's, it is, and it's a very, <laughs> it, yeah, I mean, it's cool. It's a, it's, to me, it's a very emotional process, you know, when it's going right. Yeah. I can't be happier. I'm just high as a kite. I'm one with the universe, you know, Absolutely. but if, if you're, you know, struggling with a piece, it's just crazy. Yeah. Making, and know? then your whole mess is, uh, your life is a mess because yeah. you're trying to get it right. all back There's onto dissonance. that. dissonance, yeah. 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 You're trying to get back onto that, uh, oh, I need to get back on that track, but it's, it's a, just working through it. It's just mm-hmm. keep going and working through it and it's going to work its way out. Um, yeah, I mean, I was always one of those people growing up, I never wanted to die with these ideas and because I've you hear that all the time like you said there's so many people who have these incredible ideas like well I'll come back to that next year I'm going to do this or the people who just keep talking and talking and talking um you know you never want to I, I could never be that person so when I have these ideas I try to figure out how am I going to make this happen or else it will drive me nuts and mm-hmm. you know I would rather try and go down and and a flame just knowing I tried um that's what I did, you know. I I I um <laughs> I um I drew in magic marker on a piece of typing paper, shut up and draw, and I put it over my drawing table, and I still have it. It's brown and rotty, you know, ratty, and yeah. but it was the, it was the moment that I sat down and I made the, this this project a priority, and and that was you know I had let other things take you know much more importance over the years and and I reached a time in my life where I I I had decided that this I really had to sit down and buckle down and 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 put in the thousands of hours and you got to I mean you got you really do got to cut out the Mm, bullshit you do and you got to focus and hone down you got to be on top of your game Mm -hmm. if you want to get to that level Mm -hmm. where people like yourself and um you know, I, I hope one day I can get to that level too. And but it is putting the time and just focusing. And um, you know, some people. I mean, the, all even with my artwork, I get a lot of the times where people are like, "Gosh, this is what you do." Kind of, it's what what a waste of time. Or it's kind of like they. It's like I have the same amount of time as you. I just put it towards something else, and I get to do this for a living. And it just depends on how people look at it. But you got to. It, you got to put the time in and people see that if they take the time to look right and i think people especially today with phones and computers i and tv the amount of hours the average person takes staring at a phone or a computer or a tv it's hours oh, yeah. and think of transferring those hours into a creative pursuit absolutely and yeah. i tell that people a lot of the times i mean i speak at colleges actually that's how i met brandon um was he was one of the students i was speaking at sdsu and people was like well where do you get the time from i'm like well let me see you guys are 
um, you guys are going to a party probably later tonight, right? I'm like, you guys are on your phones, you're doing this. I'm like, you got to cut all that out. I mean, obviously right now in college, you could probably get away with it a little bit. But after you look at you have the 24 hours, how are you going to use those minutes and those hours in each day? If you're watching the TVs, if you're YouTubing, if you're doing all that, I'm like, I hate TV. I really, really do. I do not like TV. And if I watch TV, it's typically a documentary or something. But you got to get rid of the things that are almost kind of a waste of time. You might be able to have it in the background, but for me too, I'm almost going to be still distracted by that. So I have to shut it off and focus and be in my element, find my sanctuary and really develop my craft. Cause when you get in that zone, it's a high, mm-hmm. it's this rush. Um, and yes, it is all sober. Uh, when I'm doing, it. I know some artists who do, and that's cool if you, if you need to, if you need to find your own thing, but you got to find the time to focus and get rid of the other distractions a hundred percent. And some people won't, don't want to take that, that they don't want to do that because it's just, you know, it's all about the social media and how, you know, they think it's, it's not cool if you're by yourself, but I need, I need to be by myself as an artist. And that's where I think, I mean, so everyone has has to find that I think inside of them to spend the time with themselves and put the time in and the work in. And it's amazing what you can get done when you focus and, and put the time in. And that's just what it takes in any industry. If you want to be the best in it, you've got to work harder than the next person. And it's going to show, it's going to show hands down. I think it's almost easier this day and age to be successful because there's so many people who just, it's too hard it's too hard. People want to give up so quick. I mean, there's people who are like, all I have to do is set up a booth and start selling my work. I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, you got to set up your booth. You got to have the product and they don't even want to do that. They don't even want to go talk to the market manager to see how they can get into it. Mm -hmm. I mean, so. And people are terrified of criticism of their work. Absolutely. You know, that was a hurdle that I had to meditate on before I even got started was to just settle myself and become at peace with the inevitability of somebody not liking my work or liking me you know it's impossible and 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 one way that i arrived at you know this type of peace is to think of the people that are the most brilliant at whatever they've done you can pick out a scientist a artist or you know a writer that you think is just a brilliant, amazing person at the top of their career, and every one of them has a critic. You know, yeah. there's always somebody who disagrees with them, doesn't like their work, and it's, you know, I say they're like remoras on a shark, you know? And so I just went, okay, no matter what I do, no matter what I put out, it will be criticized, yeah. but, you know, I have something to say with these stories and characters that I hope does reach people and does have a positive effect and that that the drive to create something that you know to communicate with people about about nature and social issues and things you know basically uh, you know, was much more of a important thing than worrying about somebody not liking my work. You know? yeah. yeah. Once you can get over that, right. then everything else is good. Sure. You got to get, you got to get past the rejection and, right. and get past um, mm-hmm. what other people are going to think because that can crush your career even before it's even off the mm-hmm. ground. I mean, you, once you get past that, I think you're, you're already, you're almost halfway there once you just let yourself go and see where it takes you. Right. Yeah. Well, um, well, Stella Luna, um, so the, going back to this book and how it got to where it is, because, I mean, currently, I, I know it's coming into its 25th, it already had its 25th anniversary. Um, it's also translated into 30 languages, which I think is phenomenal. This book is sold worldwide. It's been out there. Um, I think this is anyone who thinks of a bat book, I think they're going to think of Stella Luna. I mean, that's... Um, hands down, the first book I, I I remember is, yeah, I think you did your job well because you said there was only one bat book left that was out there and you found that missing link and you fulfilled it and you did an incredible job with it. How does it feel um, looking back, knowing that it's translated and gotten to where it is? I mean, how does it feel knowing? Well, what I 
wanted to accomplish was to create a book that had a universal um, uh, appeal. Uh, when I worked in the children's department, I, I worked up in a lot of the areas, you know, putting up, you know, exhibits and things. And I observed kids, and I I noticed, especially grade schoolers, there was, there were triggers, you know, where they go, well, that's a girl's book, that's a boy's book. And I looked at these books and, you know, really studied what, you know, shut kids down on on books, you know, for whatever reason. And so what my idea was is that I wanted to write a book that that boys and girls could relate to the character and all ages for that matter. And um, I wanted to write about how no matter who you are, you feel sort of like a bat in a bird's nest, you know, to varying degrees. You know, there are there are people, you know, it just depends, you know, if if you're a somebody who's a minority in a particular society or you know whatever situation you're in where you're not in the mainstream you're real this book will really resonate but everybody to a certain degree i wanted to you know for them to look into the book and it would mirror their own story of of that type of feeling where you know you're you're feeling a little out of step with things and and then the ability to, um, you know, reconcile that and find your community. And um, there was the old story, the ugly duckling. Yeah, I was just going to bring up well, the ugly and, duckling. And the, I was just going to bring I, up the ugly duckling. I convoluted it in that, that um, in the ugly duckling, that little um, gosling was tormented by the other you know, duck, she was bullied. Yeah. But what I wanted to do is to reflect a lot of my own experience in that my worst critic has always been myself. Yeah. And and you can beat yourself up, you know, from within when everybody's just fine around you, you know. Like if you notice in this story, the baby birds are just more curious about her and they, you know, encourage her and but her struggle is more from the inside. So it's, you know, and I think that it's that, you know, a lot of, you know, I think, you know, some people, it's, it's varying degrees. We have inner and outer struggles to fit in. Wow. Yeah, that's, uh, that's deep. And it's true. I mean, I, I love, uh, I love the book even more now. <laughs> there's, uh, there's a lot to these. I mean, that's why I love even having you here and explain it a little bit more. It really opens up to, uh, to what it is. Um, Stella Luna, I, want, I, I know I keep going back to Stella Luna just because I think it's so fascinating as, I mean, it is, I mean, I'm looking even right here. It's a Reading Rainbow book. Um, you know, it's part of the National Education Association, the School Library Journal's list of 100 best children's book of all time. Um, and then Scholastic, you know, you're, you know, one of them. I mean, is this one of the things that it just kept, it was like a snowball effect? Like once you, once you got that, um, published, I mean, did it kind of have a life of itself? Um, it did, and that's exactly how I describe it. It does have a life of its own, and I'm just sort of watching it unfold. Uh, and because I had hoped for it to have a universal appeal, um, regardless of what language you speak, what culture you're from, what age you are, what gender, whatever, you know, um, that it would speak to you. And because it's being translated into you know languages around the world it's 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 proven itself i'm thrilled you know yeah. i just signed a, a contract for turkish now and oh, recently wow. it was tibetan and kurdish and so it's reaching further and further out and it's also a story of of tolerance you know, it's it's that final question. How can we feel so different and be so much the same? How can we be so much the same and feel so different? And I asked that question the first time I went overseas and tra traveled to Thailand. I felt so much at home there and part of everything, but yet culturally I, could, I couldn't really speak the language and I, they had a whole different frame of reference. So there was this paradoxical 
thing going on. Oh. And I thought, you know, what if we just simply could suspend ourselves in that in that paradox rather than saying, I'm right, you're wrong, you know, and 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 so hence it's it's more of a position of, of tolerance and just, you know, recognizing differences without having to, you know, attach your ego to wherever you are and and, you know, yeah. judge other people. And one of the highlights for me is that I, over the years, uh, there was a group of people in Saudi Arabia who published it in Arabic, and there was another group that published it in Hebrew in Israel. Hmm. So somewhere in this part of the world that's had centuries of differences, they are reading a book of tolerance to children. Wow. So I'm hoping, you know, I don't know. It's just... It's, it's got to be a pretty incredible feeling to know yeah. that it can go, you know, globally mm -hmm. and translate to so many different people. And um, is that... So you have written six books. Is that what you think is different about this book compared to your other books? Um, Castell Loon, I think, I think you would agree too, is, is probably the most successful book. I mean, and that was your first book too. Right. Um, you know, like Verdi, you know, the snake, you know, this is the, the snake um, book. What is the main difference you think from Stella Luna to your other, because all your, all your books are, children's books are about animals and are these illustrations you've created. Uh, but what is it about the Stella Luna that kind of set, sets itself apart from the other five? Well, Verdi, for instance, was, I wrote that when I was 40 years old and this book is more more than any of the other six books from my perspective as a kid about being afraid to transition into a uh, what I thought was a grown up. I I looked at the adults around me and they're just sitting around talking and you know it was like I, because I was a very active kid and I just wanted to be outside and run and look at things and play and and to become you know, sedentary and, you know, basically it was like Charlie Brown. You'd hear the adults, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know? And it was like, no, I can't, I can't envision myself turning into that. So this book is about a fear of transition and, and a concept of what, you know, being afraid of what you might turn into. And, and that can apply to any age and any point in your life where you're, you know, even a little kid turning into a teenager or a second grader going into third grade or, or you know, getting older and, and, and uh, you know, becoming elderly. And so, so this is like a comical take on, on what, what this little character does to you know he ends up fighting an inevitable process and and it's sort of like how you fall from grace when you fight the universe you know where you're fighting something that's not within your control and it and there's a lot of symbolism in that book where you know he tries to keep the color of his skin from changing and he does all these artificial things you know just like we do you know people resort to dyeing their hair and getting plastic surgery and doing all these things to stop this inevitable process of aging yeah. and so you know it and and what i want wanted to say to whomever is reading it, especially kids, is that your essential self, your soul, and who you really are never changes. Well, now they know. <laughs> <laughs> That's the big thing. In, but, you know, but, it, but these are all drawn, even if you're not focusing on these, yeah. the, the deeper issues that I like to weave in, they're meant to be entertaining. And, and you, you know, do a great job. Yeah, of, yeah. Of, in the I like a lot folder. of humor and, yes. and to draw the, the animals in their natural beauty and, and to then add the science at the end. After I get done studying the anatomy and physiology and the environment of these animals, I just feel compelled to put the science bit in the back. And so kids can learn, you know, their scientific name and about their species and, you know, how they fit into to the ecological. What do you uh, do with your originals uh, for the artwork? Because I know I brought this up with you before. Mm -hmm. um, 
and you're saving them right for what tell me about tell me about that about what you're doing with your originals because you don't sell them no um it's interesting because back when I worked at the library, we had the opportunity to contact Theodore Geisel, Dr. Seuss, and he lived in La Jolla. Yeah, local guy. And we asked if we could show some of his original art at the library. And he said, yeah, go ahead, you know, but we have it all in archives at UCLA. But you can go up there, make an appointment, and you can pick out what you want. And... Um, and I was just in a, because he was one of my all-time heroes. And so uh, I went up there with Pat, and we got the chance to go through archives of all of his mock-ups and originals from even before he wrote children's books. Wow. He, he was a graphic artist, too. Yeah. And so I was just blown away by being able to have access to this. So fast forward, when my book became well-known, I thought, you know, I think that's a really neat thing to do to keep the collection intact and then have it be more of a public property huh. and to have it available, you know, as an entire collection. And it has come in handy to um, have all the pieces in one place. A lot of um, illustrators sell piece by piece and they're collected by people all over the, you know, all over the place. So if you want to reprint anything, you have to retrieve these pieces. And um, this last year when we, uh, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt wanted to recreate the 25th, you know, a 25th anniversary edition of Stella Luna, um, they, they wanted all of the originals uh, to be rescanned. So it was easy for me. I had them all in one place. I shipped them back, and they um, scanned them at you know high res, and they did an exquisite job at um, with the reprint. Wow, I think that's as a business side. I think that's phenomenal because you were able to make your living off of these books and still have the all the originals. I would think, as an artist illustrator, you're going to make a good amount of your money from. You know, selling some originals, the collectors doing that. So that that's a, I think that's incredible that you can do that. And I, in the book industry, I mean, you know, being able to keep it out there. I mean, that that's that's how you make your living. You know, keeping it going mm-hmm. and um, and yeah. good on you for keeping keeping those originals. You knew that at a young age, right? And and you know, you've learned that too. Yeah. You know, I tried to sell you know paint and sell paintings and you'll just starve yeah even if you're successful and you sell all your pa- the amount of time that goes into each painting and residual yeah. income if you can get right. into residual exactly. income um in any yeah. industry i mean that's where it's at mm-hmm. i mean obviously the movie industry you know artists i mean disney you know has really helped out with myself and i know you know for authors i mean that's where that's how you make your money so I, I i think that's so cool that you still get your originals and you get an archive bump for people to uh see in the future mm-hmm. uh, so you travel a lot um i mean you're, you're you're out there you're you're talking about bats your animals i mean i definitely consider you a bat expert i mean over your years if i ever have a bat question i'm i'm going to janelle um what is your favorite place to travel where do you like to go um well, you know, I think everywhere in the world is interesting. One of the things I like to do is virtually travel via Google Earth. Okay. I, I zoom in all over the world. It's incredible what you can see on Google Earth. And so when I'm interested in an area, um, I just zoom around and I just poke around, you know, in these very interest. I'm interested in Greenland right now. Okay. And just zooming in around on the fjords and everything is just, it's gotten me, you know, more and more focused on particular places to go. It's hard to get around there. Uh, as opposed to Iceland, they have an entire ring road and infrastructure that it's easy to get around the entire island. But Greenland, it's all chopped up. You have to either take a small plane or a boat, and the villages, you know, might have 50 to 100 people, tiny little, you know, enclaves of people. So, so, but, you know, this, and it's a huge island, and so I, you know, I'm 
looking at where I could go and how much time I would have. And so I do a lot of strategizing by using Google Earth. Huh. And, and yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing how you quickly you can af- you know, absorb the topography and then zero in on the context of a community in, a, in its natural environment very quickly. Well, so. where's this uh, place? I know you have this up on your laptop right here. Yeah. So, so tell um, me about what this is, because this happened pretty recently in the last couple of years right. here. When I um, started illustrating Stella Luna, the, the bat that I selected was the Gambian epauletted fruit bat, and it lives in um, East Africa. And back in the 90s, I didn't really have the wherewithal to travel to Africa. I didn't have the time. I really didn't have the money. And so I just had to, you know, focus on the bat. And and I didn't really, I wasn't, I just kept the background to suggest, you know, the African environment. And I just, you know, focused on my studies of the bat itself. So I never got to go to this bat's, uh, you know, native territory. And I've always been... Luna's home. (laughs) Yeah. And so fast forward to the couple of years before the 25th anniversary, a very good friend of mine, her name is Fiona Reed. She's a very uh, well-known field guide, illustrator, writer, and wildlife tour guide. And she was taking, leading a trip to, to Africa, South Africa, and she invited me along uh, with a small group, and then we were going to split off afterwards. We <laughs> rented a pickup truck in Johannesburg and headed to Kruger Park, where we were told that there were colonies of epauletted fruit bats. And so I was thrilled to finally get a chance to see these bats in the wild. And so what we have here on the laptop is a video of a uh, it's called a sausage tree because it has these large sausage-shaped uh, fruit. But um, this was the first time I got to see these bats um, in their native habitat. Yeah, so if you go to our YouTube yeah. uh, channel, you'll be able to watch this video. Right now yeah. it is a picture. It looks like a tree. Yeah. Um, it, it, there's not much okay. going on right now. And then when, she's, yeah. <laughs> you, when you zoom in, oh, they are all, they, they're all in there. Yeah, those are... Th- those are like the ones at the San Diego. Uh, are Correct. those the exact same ones at the San um, Diego there Wildlife? There are a number of epauletted fruit bat species. They look similar, um, but uh, gosh, look at yeah. them! Those are big bats. Yeah, well, and that's because each one has a big baby. Wrapped oh, there's a baby in, in yeah. there too. All of them are nursing mothers. So there they are all day. They're bathing and nursing their babies, uh, and then they go out at night to look for fruit. So 25 years later, you found Stella Luna. Right. (laughs) So I called this trip the Searching for Stella Luna trip. And so I got to spend hours uh, studying. And and it was just a very wonderful chance that it was during the time of year where they were raising their young. So Yeah, how cool was that? You really zoomed in and got to see see them uh, with their their young. Yeah. what advice would you give an artist um, who is starting out their career or someone who wants to uh, get their book uh, you know, published? I know it's changed over the years, especially uh, getting your book published, but is there any advice that you would give to an artist who's coming Well, up? the way I started out was to not expect much. Um, my vision was that I would still be working at the library and I'd have a bunch of books maybe on a, a backlist circulating around and I would have a second income. That was my highest expectation when I started this. And I got lucky, you know. I think my letters... Well, I think, you, I think you're, you made your own luck. A, a lot of people well, say, it, I think you got lucky, but you also, you, you deserve what you got because you... It's a combination. I did a tremendous amount of preparation, but it all these things landed on the right desk at the right time with the right people. There is some blind, dumb luck sure, involved. Sure, you know? sure, sure. And, and it was a golden age of children's books. The, the economy was booming. Publishers were just diving in and trying a lot of new things. They were willing to uh, work with me, a new person from nowhere. 
You know, I don't know if I would have had the same chance right now. Yeah, I was going to say it yeah. might be different because now it would almost be email that you would have to. And then you would also. Um, yeah, just, and, and after the recession, it really hit the publishing industry. And then the electronic alternatives have have really changed things. It's kind of um it's it's both things I, I you know right now it's possible to self publish um, successfully in the past if you self published it had a stigma of being you know the vanity press and you know it meant that you weren't good enough to get published by a publishing house now you know, it's it's tougher on publishing houses to take risks, and so it's harder to get books published um, uh, in the conventional way. And yet, it's easier now to produce books. There's that you can produce a children's book on demand. You know, you can if you write and design and illustrate a book that is of quality. You can. There's many different online services that you can uh, get your book designed and printed kind of and like for like Kindle fire yeah and for you know Google right. and all, I mean you yeah can and you can go. provide it electronically or even get bound copies and you don't have to have a massive the production inventory. Oh yeah my gosh, the inventory alone would just put you down right you and then you don't such. know if you know your garage might have 10,000 books and they're sitting. not selling you know so the risks are were high but now I, and I've seen people produce some really nice kids books um, with this sort of on-demand printing and then the the ability to create websites that are accessible to people around the world. You know, your reach is now global. Um, you can sell online. I think a lot of people now put their books on Amazon yeah, and other yeah, uh, websites. So so the the game has changed. You know, at once it's at simultaneously in some ways it's harder to get published in other ways the 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 playing field has been leveled you know where if you're creative and 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 you understand technology and and computer design you have a tremendous amount of opportunity to to create and control your own you know work yeah so it's Almost going back to if you're willing to put the time and the work into it, you can you can right. almost do it yourself, especially yes. on the online sense. Yeah, um, which yeah. is you're right because when you got in, when that book was published, there was no internet and there was it, it was literally you had to buy a, a hard a soft book or a hard book. Mm -hmm. And I'd say a lot of books now. Can you tell the difference um, on sales when it's coming in? through digital books or actual hard copy books? Is there a, have you seen that shift to where it's more digital books now? Um, I don't know if you get those numbers well, or if you kind of have seen You mean that, with my own books? Like with or, your own books? Or, uh, can you tell if it's um, going I towards that? I don't really have, I have some online um, book availability, but I believe that hardcover in children's picture books in particular continues to be the majority of the sales because parents like to it's a participatory thing between parents and kids yeah so you can so read night, yeah night story. and and so i think families still like having the physical book sure that makes and, sense. and i think a lot of families still like to um introduce their kids to to, books. to hardcover books uh, that's true because yeah, yeah. With kids books like i read at night with my kids and we sit on the love yeah. sack and we love to open and my 16 18 month old you know she's definitely opening books more so it's important to to have that um because yeah i mean just i think with digital i mean i even sell still alone on like netflix right and on like some mm -hmm. of those people uh, read it on yeah yeah mm -hmm. where you can there they've had a show on on that so i just mm -hmm. i kind of see it interesting going more that digital uh, but i think you know as you as a parent know it's it's a way to 
um, hang with your kids in 3D. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's physical. You're there. You're you're interacting directly, and you have this you know physical, you know object this book and you're looking at the written word you're interpreting images it's you know you're processing a lot of things with your kids in an interactive way and I think kids just naturally thrive on interaction they want to do everything with you it doesn't matter what it is yeah you know and so I think that's why the physical um children's books picture books are still popular all right so janelle i want to know about this piece here because honestly this reminds me as a doodler as an artist this is what i was doing in middle school high school um is this are you a doodler absolutely um since i was in grade school doodling was a constant during class um, you know, the classroom pace was always crazy making, you yes. know, the, the teacher would be going along and then, you know, explain a point and then somebody would raise her hand and go, well, what about this? And then she'd have to start all over again. So I just went nuts. So I got in the habit of, you know, when they, when they were reiterating something, I would just go into the rest mode and draw and it allowed me to be patient, you know, with what was going on. And then I could click back in when they got back on track. Yeah. So, so it was a way for me to, to disengage while the, you know, they had to loop. How, and, how old were yeah. you when you did this one? Well, this one is probably 10th through 12th grade, this wow. stuff. And it was just the exact size of the desk. So, so could, this was just on the desk, and then I would just escape into. Because yeah, I could see like inside, like going in. The, yeah. I mean, this is what I was doing. I, I, I would tell a story inside of my doodles, and when the teacher was talking, I heard something interesting. I'd kind of draw about it. And with yours, I completely see that. With again, all the different animals, these people, kind of what were going on in your life at the time and i see a lot of doodle artists because that's what i do um and this is where it begins right. middle school high school um a lot of people stop doodling after high school or college um and it just kind of goes away mm -hmm. um but this is it's so cool to see uh i did not know that you were a you were a doodle I artist still am you and, still are. and i listen better while i'm doodling you know, yeah. I, I find that when I'm at meetings and such, um, I'm everything I have is doodles all over it because, you know, again, I'll, they'll make a point, but then they might have to reiterate something. So then I disengage until they proceed, you know, on to the next thing. So, yeah, this was a this survival is... mechanism for me. And I was a geek and a nerd and an introvert. <laughs> and so it was my way of, of just, you know, yeah, it was just a, a survival for me in in junior high, high school, even grade school. Yeah. So this is definitely your doodle. You're also an illustrator. So there's other pictures in here, too. I'm, I'm guessing <laughs> that you have created. Can we see some well, of your Well, my favorite your thing, I used here? to draw with big pens, and back then they were 19 cents a piece, and they lasted <laughs> forever, and that was the only thing I could afford. So that's what I drew with. And so these these are just unfinished but um, so I was just exploring, uh, you know, using half tones with the ballpoint and then coming in with watercolor and um, just trying to, you know, this is just trying to render water and stone and, um, you know, just beginner's attempts to, and then doodles on the side. Beautiful. Yeah, there's yeah. always, always doodles on homework, on <laughs> right. tests. Right. And then, you know, just it was just playing with plant forms and you know trees leaves bark animals and i like to weave hidden you know life forms into the uh into so the i can see all this little writing along oh the yeah edges yeah and... right it's just a constant constant because i basically have a really busy inner world and, sure and this um, is how you get it out yeah yeah and it's just a it's waking dream kind of this was an oil pastel it was an unsuccessful combo but you know, it was just part of the experimenting. So yeah, these were just ones that I never finished. 
I used to hang out with my sister at the University of, Cal University of Minnesota dorm. And in the winter, we used to store all our fruit in the windows because uh, it was a, like a refrigerator. You could put all the fruit there and it would stay cold in the window. <laughs> nice. We'd just close the window, uh, the curtains, and it would store the our best fruit. That's refrigeration yeah, yeah. system right yeah, there. Right. Very cool. So. Well, um, but Let's, yeah, I, I felt that, you know, with your experience as yeah. a young person. I mean, was, doodling, that's yeah. that's where, yeah. I, honestly, everyone that I'm talking to who doodle, um, they starts in middle school, mm -hmm. high school, and then a lot of the time it drops off. But the people like you and myself, where I need it to function on a day-to-day -day basis, like, I mean, if I don't get my doodling out, my artwork out, I'm a mess. I mean, I uh, used to be very hyper as a kid. Um, I was kind of the opposite of you, a very hyper. I was kind of the class clown and, you know, like I was, I was a mess, but the teachers realized is if they put me in a corner and just let me draw, I wasn't a distraction to the other students. And so the teachers either loved me or they hated me. And the ones that let me just draw and keep to myself, you know, they had a pretty quiet class, but the other ones that didn't, you know, it was a mess. So I need it to survive, honestly, like doodling and drawing really did help me over the years and become the person I am today. And because what would you have done without teachers that didn't know that or didn't see that in yeah. you? I had teachers that saved me, you know, they yeah. fostered my art. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm very thankful. And mm -hmm. now doodling is becoming more and more acceptable. Now they actually don't even call it doodling. It's the Zen doodle or Zen <laughs> everything. And I mean, to me, right. I think it's kind of funny. But yeah, I mean, we were doing that years and years ago. And doodling is where it stemmed for me. But a lot of people look at my work and they're like, oh, this is the new thing. That's Zen tangle. Zen tangle. Yeah. There it is. And, and I'm it's like, meditative. Yeah. Sure. And mm -hmm. it, it is. It's how we. Yeah. It's a. Uh, we need doodling, you know, and I think they're starting to see that. Yeah, I think if you, you know, they hooked our brains up while we were doing it, we would go into a different frequency. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It would be kind of cool to see someone hook up to right. see where what, what our brains are doing. That'd be a great next one, you know, get somebody in here with all that equipment. And, that would be cool. Yeah. Well. Is it time for a uh, story time uh, with uh, Janelle Cannon? Sure. I haven't <laughs> read this in a while. I'm, I'm excited. a little rusty, but I'll do my best. I, I do. I feel like I just need some popcorn and I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm ready to go. In a warm and sultry forest, far, far away, there once lived a mother fruit bat and her new baby. Oh, how mother bat loved her soft, tiny baby. I'll name you Stella Luna, she crooned. Each night, Mother Bat would carry Stella Luna clutched to her breast as she flew out to search for food. One night, as Mother Bat followed the heavy scent of ripe fruit, an owl spied her. On silent wings, the powerful bird swooped down upon the bats. Dodging and shrieking, Mother Bat tried to escape, but the owl struck again and again, knocking Stella Luna into the air. Her baby wings were as limp and useless as wet paper. Down, down she went, faster and faster into the forest below. The dark leafy tangle of branches caught Stella Luna as she fell. One twig was small enough for Stella Luna's tiny feet. Wrapping her wings about her, she clutched the thin branch, trembling with cold and fear. Mother, Stella Luna squeaked, where are you? By daybreak, the baby bat could hold on no longer. Down, down again, she dropped. Flump! Stella Luna landed head first in a soft, downy nest, startling the three baby birds who lived there. Stella Luna quickly clambered from the nest and hung out of sight below it. She listened to the babble of the three birds. What was that? cried Flap. I don't know, but it's hanging by its feet, chirped Flitter. Shh, here comes Mama, hissed Pip. Many, many times that day, Mama Bird flew away, always returning with food for her babies. Stella Luna was terribly hungry, 
but not for the crawly things that Mama Bird brought. Finally, though, the little bat could bear it no longer. She climbed into the nest, closed her eyes, and opened her mouth. Plop! In dropped a big green grasshopper. Still, Aluna learned to be like the birds. She stayed awake all day and slept at night. She ate bugs even though they tasted awful. Her bat ways were quickly disappearing. Except for one thing, Stella Luna still liked to sleep hanging by her feet. Once, when Mama was away, the curious baby birds decided to try it too. When Mama Bird came home, she saw eight tiny feet gripping the edge of the nest. Eek! she cried. Get back up here this instant. You're going to fall and break your necks. <laughs> the birds clambered back into the nest, but Mama Bird stopped Stella Luna. You are teaching my children to do bad things. I'll not let you back into this nest unless you promise to obey all the rules of this house. Stella Luna promised. She ate bugs without making faces. She slept in the nest at night, and she didn't hang by her feet. Stella Luna behaved like a good bird should. All the babies grew quickly, and soon the nest became crowded. Mama Bird told them it was time to learn to fly. One by one, Pip, Flitter, Flap, and Stella Luna jumped from the nest. Their wings worked! Oh, I'm just like them, thought Stella Luna. I can fly too. Pip, Flitter, and Flap landed gracefully on a branch. Stella Luna tried to do the same. Oh, how embarrassing. I will fly all day, Stella Luna told herself. Then nobody will see how clumsy I am. The next day, Pip, Flitter, Flap, and Stella Luna went flying far from home. They flew for hours, exercising their new wings. Well, the sun is setting, warned Flitter. Well, we better go home or we'll get lost in the dark, said Flap. But Stella Luna had flown far ahead and was nowhere to be seen. The three anxious birds went home without her. All alone, Stella Luna flew and flew until her wings ached and she dropped into a tree. I promise not to hang by my feet, Stella Luna sighed. So she hung by her thumbs and soon fell asleep. She didn't hear the soft sound of wings coming near. Hey, a loud voice said. Why are you hanging upside down? Stella Luna's eyes opened wide. She saw a most peculiar face. I'm not upside down. You are, Stella Luna said. Ah, but you're a bat. Bats hang by their feet. You are hanging by your thumbs, so that makes you upside down. I'm a bat, and I'm hanging by my feet. That makes me right side up. Stella Luna was confused. Mama Bird told me I was upside down. She said I was wrong. Wrong for a bird, maybe, but not for a bat. More bats gathered around to see the strange young bat who behaved like a bird. Stella Luna told them her story. You, you ate bu bugs, stuttered one. You slept at night, gasped another. How very, very strange, they all murmured. Wait, wait, let me look at this child. A bat pushed through the crowd. An owl attacked you, she asked. Sniffing Stella Luna's fur, she whispered, You're Stella Luna? You're my baby! 
You escaped the owl, cried Stella Luna. You survived? Yes, said Mother Bat as she wrapped her wings around Stella Luna. Come with me and I'll show you where to find the most delicious fruit. You'll never have to eat another bug as long as you live. But it's nighttime, Stella Luna squeaked. We can't fly in the dark or we'll crash into trees. We're bats, Mother Bat said. We can see in the darkness. Come with us. Stella Luna was afraid, but she let go of the tree and dropped into the deep blue sky. Stella Luna could see. She felt as though rays of light shone from her eyes. She was able to see everything in her path. Soon the bats found a mango tree and Stella Luna ate as much of the fruit as she could hold. I'll never eat another bug as long as I live, shared Stella Luna as she stuffed herself full. I must tell Pip, Flitter, and Flap. The next day, Stella Luna went to visit the birds. Come with me and meet my bat family, said Stella Luna. Okay, let's go, agreed Pip. They hang by their feet and they fly at night and they eat the best food in the world, Stella Luna explained to the birds on the way. As the birds flew among the bats, Flap said, I feel upside down here. So the birds hung by their feet. Wait until dark, Stella Luna said excitedly. We will fly at night. When night came, Stella Luna flew away. Pip, Flitter, and Flap leapt from the tree to follow her. I can't see a thing, yelled Pip. Neither can I, howled Flitter. Eek, shrieked Flap. They're going to crash, gasped Stella Luna. I must rescue them. Stella Luna swooped about, grabbing her friends in the air. She lifted them to a tree, and the birds grasped a branch. Stella Luna hung from the limb above them. We're safe, said Stella Luna. Then she sighed. I wish you could see in the dark, too. Well, we wish you could land on your feet, Flitter replied. Pip and Flap nodded. They perched in silence for a long time. How can we be so different and feel so much alike, mused Flitter. Well, how can we feel so different and be so much alike, wondered Pip. Hmm, I think this is quite a mystery, Flip Flap chirped. I agree, said Stella Luna. But we're friends, and that's a fact. The end. Wow. I felt like I was a kid all over <laughs> again. <laughs> that was awesome. I wish uh, I wish you could read to us every night. I guess now you can with the, uh, sure. the podcast. There Absolutely. it is. Um, thank you for that. That was incredible. And uh, being able to hear the author read uh, you know, the book, that is even... Well, it's a delight to read to you. You're, you're the generation that grew up with these books. I, I consider all of you my kids. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Is there anything uh, else that you want to, you know, end on or, or say, um, you know, regarding your journey or uh, to anyone out there listening? Well, I felt that I created the book for its own sake first. I had a, a dream to create a body of work that I felt proud of. And I was going to create this story regardless of whether I published it or not. I did it for its own sake and to, to show myself that I could do it. And then I went on to, you know, venture out and take risks into putting it out into the world. So, so essentially I framed this venture as a win-win. Um, I've considered it a win to complete the story and this entire body of work. I was happy at that point. And if nothing else ever happened, I was still happy. 
And um, so that was the basis on which I then, you know, took the risks and, and launched it out and, and under the scrutiny of agents and publishers and such. So that's, I don't know if that is, you know, but that's fundamentally um, what gave me the courage to, you know, create the book in the first place. So it goes back to doing what you love. Exactly. It all goes back to that. Absolutely. Well, Janelle, thank you so much. That is the business. And I am so honored to have you here. And hopefully down the road, we can have you uh, back and we'll see where that goes. But thank you. And until uh, next time, that is the Viz Art Podcast, the business of art. Appreciate you coming out this time. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. You got it. Thank you.